Let us pray. <clears throat> Please bow your heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you sent your Holy Spirit to this earth to speak to us. And yet not everybody hears your voice. Make us in that number that will hear you this evening. Give us a sensitive heart. There are so many distractions in the world. Please help us, Father. Let your Holy Spirit be mightily present with us as you've been in past sessions. Thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> it's... 20, 30 years since I've been coming to the Gulf every year. Not been able to do that in the past couple of years, but it's wonderful that we can do this through Zoom. Praise the Lord for that. I just thought of this song we just sang, beautiful song. It's one of my favorites. It's been one of my favorites for many, many years. And it says here, you know, I wonder if um, this, you know, when we sing, Jesus says, when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Did you recognize that Jesus was there in your meeting? And that you are actually speaking to him, Lord, king of my life, I crown you now. Lest I forget your thorn crown, bow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. You're speaking to Jesus now, you're not just singing a song. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share. Because thou hast borne all for me. I'd encourage you sometime to go back to that song. Get those words. And read them slowly. And ask yourself. Whether you are, whether you meant every word of what you sang just now, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. I'm not trying to judge any of you. I'm judging myself. Nobody told me what I'm telling you now, ever, in my 64 years as a Christian. What I told you now, I never heard in a single meeting. And what is the result? I would sing so many songs. And the tune and the song, and I knew the words. Sometimes I didn't even have to look at the songbook because I knew it so well. But I was not conscious that I was speaking to Jesus. I was not conscious that Jesus Christ, my Lord, was right there in the middle of the meeting. And even if those of you who are watching on Zoom, you ask yourself. Even if you didn't sing, you joined in the words. Are you talking to the Lord? I'm not criticizing you. God's not called me to criticize anyone. God is my witness that I judge myself every day. I want to encourage you to judge yourself every day. It'll change your life completely. Change my life. One of the results of being baptized in the Holy Spirit about 50 years ago was that I began to seriously judge myself every single day. It made my life more at rest, more at peace, free from anxiety and fear, and more devoted to the Lord. It's even made my health better. God's been good to me.
I have to say that um, there are not many 84-year-old people who are preaching today. And there are some. Praise God for them. And I thank God that I'm one of them. But it's not my goodness. It's not anything to me. It's 100% of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, many of you are young. I gave my life to Christ when I was 19 and a half. I had many ambitions. My father was a believer, and when he put me into the National Defense Academy, and I got selected, it was 1955. I believed in the Lord, but I had not really given my life completely to him. He told me, I want you to retire as the Admiral of the Indian Navy. So I worked hard. And I worked towards that goal in trying to excel in everything. And then one day, Christ came into my life when I was 19 and a half. And all my ambitions changed for something a million times better. That is to live for Christ, not to serve him full time. No. Then I got baptized in 1961. When I was 21 years old, and I broke away from the Syrian Orthodox Church that I belonged to, and I began to understand more and more about true Christianity. I read the Word of God regularly, every day. My daily routine was, as soon as I get out of bed, kneel down and pray, and then get up and sit at my table before I go to work, whether it's on a ship or in the naval base, read the word of God very often with a notebook to write notes so that I'd remember whatever the Lord told me. And the same thing at night before I went to bed, study the scriptures, kneel down by my bed, pray, and then go to sleep. My sleep was peaceful. And I had great opportunities in the Navy to witness, and very often with opposition. My senior officers would sometimes rebuke me, condemn me. And they were not happy that I was a witness for Christ. And because of that, even though I excelled in my job, I was first in my class, they never gave me good reports because I was a Christian. And so I knew I would never become an admiral in the Navy because they didn't like people who were standing up for uprightness. Financial matters, when I was upright and did certain things, they were offended because they wanted to take advantage of money while they were working. Once, because I did something uprightly that hurt one of them financially, they transferred me from my job in half an hour. I praise the Lord. Many things like that. One of the things that came home to my heart was Gethsemane. I used to think often of the cross of Calvary, where he died for me. <clears throat> and I said, Lord, I want to love you because you love me. And I want, if I understand the depth of your love, then I will love you all right. I don't want to be a nominal Christian, I don't want to be a nominal born-again person like so many born-again people whose Christianity is not much better than the lives of the other Christians around them. I want to be a radical Christian, wholehearted. <clears throat> I never knew God would call me for his service, but that was a too high an honor for me to think of. But one day when I was 24 years old, the Lord called me to leave and I immediately put in my resignation and two years later when I was 26 I left and that is <clears throat> 58 years ago and it's been a wonderful life getting to know the Lord better more than serving him which is a great joy <clears throat> knowing him 
Paul's great passion after, <clears throat> after serving the Lord and planting churches and writing scripture was, <clears throat> he says in Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And he says that <clears throat> when he's nearly 60 years old, he's already been a Christian for 30 years and he says, I still don't know him as I should. What about you, brothers and sisters? You have a passion to know the Lord better and better and better intimately. Very closely. It says like a, our relationship with Christ is to be like a wife to the husband. <clears throat> when a woman gets married, she doesn't know much about her husband. But if she's a really good wife, <clears throat> she'll want to know more and more <clears throat> of her husband's. And if her husband is perfect like Christ, you want to know more and more of his ways and get aligned with him. That is our calling as a bride of Christ. We're not just to be like other Christians. We're not even to be like other so-called born-again believers whose Christianity is just once a week. <clears throat> and who don't have a passion. I'm not saying that we should become full-time Christian workers. You know, in our CFC churches, we have about 100 of them all over the world now. I've never asked a single person <clears throat> to go into full-time Christian work. In fact, I've discouraged them. <clears throat> I said, you be a witness where you are. It's a very high calling to go into Christian work. A lot of people in India just go to a Bible school and spend three years and go and serve the Lord and they are the biggest disgrace to the name of Christ in India. <clears throat> all these pastors will love money and who are doing a job for the sake of honor and money and title and all that rubbish. In the midst of such a testimony for Christ, which is very pathetic and poor, <clears throat> God has raised up some of us to be a pure testimony for Christ. <clears throat> when CFC started in 1975, we never started. I, Brother Ian Robson and I never decided to start a church. <clears throat> we were preaching the baptism in the Holy Spirit in a Baptist church and <clears throat> in August 1959, sorry, 1975, they said, this is against our doctrine. We don't want to hear the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We were not Pentecostals because we disagreed with the Pentecostal type of emphasis on baptism of the Holy Spirit. We wanted the genuine thing <clears throat> that the apostles got on the day of Pentecost which changed their lives. They were cowards, ashamed to witness for Christ, sitting inside locked rooms. <clears throat> they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They suddenly became on fire for God. And <clears throat> I said, Lord, that's what we want. And when we preached that, that Baptist church threw us out. I remember the date, August 17th, 1975. And Ian Robson also left. And we two families, we left. We had no intention to start CFC. CFC start, was started by that Baptist church that threw us out. So if you want to thank anybody, thank those people who threw us out. <clears throat> we just decided to meet and love the Lord. But God gradually added different people through the years. And now in so many countries, because he had a purpose and a plan to bring people who really loved him with all their hearts. <clears throat> Somebody once asked Jesus what the great commandment was. They expected him to say keeping the Sabbath or something like that. <clears throat> Matthew 22 verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? You know that. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, the, new, the great commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. But that's only one side of the coin. A coin which is only on one side is a fake. So he said there's another side to that coin. And that is you will love your neighbor as yourself. If you cannot love your fellow believers like yourself, it's a pretty high standard. Then the reason is... <clears throat> In some measure, 
you do not love Jesus Christ. The two are dependent on each other. If it is a real coin, it will be printed on both sides. If you have a coin printed on one side, throw it away. It's a fake. If you say you love Jesus and you can't love a difficult brother or sister, throw away that coin. It's fake. You don't really love the Lord. <clears throat> if you say you love Jesus, that, that's the first test here. Our theme is to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Why does it say it passes knowledge? Because you can only experience it. <clears throat> you can't just understand it. <clears throat> Many people try to understand the love of Christ in their mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it passes knowledge means I've got to know it in my heart. Many know about the love of Christ in their head. They know Jesus died for me and all that. But to know it in the heart makes a tremendous difference. Knowing it in your head may not change your way of life. <clears throat> but knowing it in your heart changes your way of life completely. It changed my life completely. <clears throat> and it made me dependent on the Lord. And the Lord began to do miracles for me, small, small things. Right from the very first, I'll tell you one of the first miracles I experienced. You may not think it's a miracle, but I saw it was. <clears throat> like other <clears throat> nominal Christians, before I gave my life to Christ in July 59, I used to go along with my naval colleagues to movies. I mean, the movies those days were not as bad as today, but <clears throat> still they were movies, you know. They were not all that good. <clears throat> They didn't have sexual scenes or any such thing, not even for one second, but they were pretty bad. <clears throat> and so I used to go along with them, and then I got converted in July 1959, and a Christ came into my life. <clears throat> my whole desires changed after that. <clears throat> so one day, <clears throat> soon after that, a couple of my naval colleagues said, hey, Zach, let's go to the movie. There's a movie inside the naval base. We have a cinema theater inside here. Let's go there. And I knew I'd finished with that. But I didn't have the courage to say, no, I'm a true Christian now. You know, like in your place of work, sometimes you're asked to do something wrong <clears throat> and you're afraid to say, I'm a true Christian. I'm sorry, sir. I can't do that. But I could not, I didn't have the courage to tell, tell them. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we walked towards the theater in the naval base. And as I walked, I was saying, Lord, please save me from this saving. I don't want to go to and see this movie. But I don't have the courage to tell these friends of mine that I finished with it. Because I used to take them in the old days. But I'm a Christian now. I'm born again. I don't want to go there, but please help me, help me, help me. And all the way to the movie theater, <clears throat> we said that. And when we came there, there was a big notice outside. We could not get the reel of the movie. So the movie today is canceled. Oh, I was so excited. They were disappointed. I was excited. Excited because <clears throat> in my helplessness <clears throat> and in my lack of courage, the Lord did a miracle for me. I think that was the first time in that naval base they didn't get the movie reel in time. And it's because God wanted to save one person, one child of his, from corrupting himself. How much God loves me. I was so touched by that. I said, Lord, I'll live for you for the rest of my life. My faith in you is real. It's not a... Un uh, non-existing God like so many other religions. There's a real father up there who cares for a person who's just newly converted so weak is willing to come and help him. This is the God we worship. This is our father. I want all of you, I want all of you young people also. I was only 19 and a half. And I thank God my life was set in the right direction from then on. And once I experienced a few other answers to prayer like this, I said, Lord, I want to fulfill your plan for my life, whatever it is. 
I didn't think of full-time Christian work. I thought of just being a witness for Christ. And I got into a lot of situations where in the Navy where I, they would ask me to do unrighteous things and I would say, no, sir, I can't do that. <clears throat> One of the first was when I was on a ship and <clears throat> we had a lot of equipment on the ship like canvas, expensive canvas, which you used to put for the roof of the decks on the ship. And <clears throat> the second in command of that ship once took a whole lot of canvas out of the ship for his personal use. Now, I was the duty officer, <clears throat> and it is my duty to record everything that went out of the ship. And most people wouldn't write that as, oh, there's a senior officer taking it out. I didn't take it. It's stealing. <clears throat> I wrote it down. Nobody had ever done that before. And the executive officer was a Hindu. He was furious with me. He couldn't tell me I was doing something wrong because he did something wrong. Taking that canvas will belong to the Navy out of the ship for his own use at home. He couldn't say that what I wrote in the duty book was wrong. So he found some other excuse, you know, that they, they had a habit of making each officer what they called a wine secretary, the one who would order all the beer and whiskey and all for the for the officers in the ship. They would take turns. And when my turn came, I told him, sir, I'm a Christian. I cannot order whiskey or anything like that for anyone. <clears throat> Skip my turn. Give it to somebody else. He was very angry. This was his turn to get revenge on me. So he decided to march me in before the commanding officer. That's it's like taking me to court. It's a naval court. That is the first stage. Next stage is court martial and the next stage is jail. Because disobedience in the Navy is a very serious thing. It's almost like a criminal act because people are being trained to instant obedience in wartime. So I went before the commanding officer. <clears throat> and he was a Roman Catholic. And this second in command said, sir, this officer is not willing to become the wine secretary. And so the commanding officer, why not? I said, sir, I'm a Christian. And I don't believe in drinking whiskey or ordering it. So he laughed and said, I'm also a Christian. This was my opportunity. I said, sir, I, was also, I also thought I was a Christian. Until I realized that I need to be born again and receive Christ into my life, which I did a couple of years ago. That was my opportunity to witness. And I discovered something that when you stand up for the Lord, okay, I'm ready to go to jail for the sake of Christ. It was almost like that. <clears throat> but I'll be a witness for Christ. I was about 21, 22 years old. And I think a little fear of God came into that Roman Catholic captain. So he told the second in command, okay, give him some other job. And I came out. But if he had told me you had to do it, I would have said, no, sir, I can't do it. And they'd have sent me to prison. That's how it is in the Navy. I thank God for these little experiences I had like that early in life. Where I go down to my room and say, Lord, I love you. And I want to prove my life, my love by obedience to your commandments, by never being ashamed to let people know that I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Another time, <clears throat> when I was in the naval base, the Lord told me to write two verses on my Lambretta scooter. Lambretta scooters have a big panel on each side. So on one side, I wrote, prepare to meet your God in about three inch letters. And the other side, I wrote, Christ died for our sins. Now, this is a strange thing for a naval officer to ride a scooter like that in his uniform with all these verses on either side. So when I went and parked my scooter at my office in the naval base, again, the second in command was a Parsi commander, said, what is this, Lieutenant Poonin? I said, sir, God's told me to write these verses. He said, I give you 24 hours to take it off. 
again, I was a, it was a test. I knew that disobedience in the Navy is a very serious crime. It's not like in a secular office. So I didn't remove it. I kept it there and I brought back the scooter the next day and he said, what is this? Still here? I said, sir, God's told me to write it and I can't remove it. To say to a senior officer, I can't do what you say is the biggest crime. Because, you know, in the military, we are trained for instant obedience because that's how you win a war. So he said, okay, I'm going to march you in to the commanding officer, just like the previous case, one step below court-martial. So he marched me in before the commanding officer. Again, in God's goodness, the commanding officer, the captain was a Roman Catholic. Oh, how God cared for me. And he said, why can't you remove it, Lieutenant Poonin? I said, sir, God told me to put it. He thought I was afraid to rub it out. He said, I'll get one of the sailors to wipe it out. I said, that's not the issue, sir. I feel God told me to keep these verses on the scooter. Well, I think he also had a little fear of God. So he said, I cannot allow you to ride that naval, that new scooter in the naval base. I said, all right, sir. I had to put the scooter outside. You know, I was so discouraged. I said, Lord, I wanted everyone in the naval base to know that they should prepare to meet their God and that Christ died for their sins. All these Hindus and Muslims, everyone around here. I was disappointed. Anyway, I put the naval scooter outside the naval base in a brother's house, and I bought a cycle, and I started riding a bicycle. Now, no naval officer ever rides a bicycle. They ride a car or a scooter. It's beneath their dignity to ride a bicycle. So when people saw me going around on a bicycle, they began to ask a question. Why is Lieutenant Poonin riding a bicycle? Somebody said, because he had some verses on his scooter. And then they asked, what were the verses on the scooter? And like that, the news went around quicker than if I had been riding around. You can't defeat God. His ways are more powerful than our ways. And I remember 40 years later in a bank in Bangalore, I met one of those retired officers saying, aren't you the one who had verses on your scooter? That news went around to so many people. But more than that, it gave me a tremendous courage as a young 23-year-old man. I'd just been converted three or four years that God would stand by me. Very thankful. I remember another instance where I was in charge of all the boats in the naval base. And officers were permitted to use a boat if they wanted to go for a picnic, provided they paid for the diesel. But if the captain of the naval base used the boat, we were not supposed to give him a bill. We were not supposed to charge him. We were to write off that picnic as a harbor inspection by the captain. That is unrighteous. So when I was boat officer, and the captain took the boat, I sent him a bill. First time in his life, he gets a bill. And so he's too big a man to talk to me. He sends a second in command to me. He asks me, why did you send the captain a bill? I said, sir, he used the boat for a personal picnic with his family. And he said, didn't the previous boat officer tell you how to write that in the record? I said, sir, I'm a Christian. It goes against my conscience to do that. I cannot write something false. In half an hour, I was transferred from my job. I had some wonderful experiences like that. I knew the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, like we have our theme. Passes knowledge means we experience it. Knowledge is in the head. Experiences in the heart. Many people who know the love of Christ in their mind will not take a stand for him. They love money. They love their job. They love security in the earth. And so they'll compromise. They will not be outstanding witness for Christ. They will not let the light shine in the darkness. There's darkness around them and they merge with the darkness because they're afraid they lose their job. They're afraid they lose, displease their bosses or something like that. And so what is the result? I'm not saying they go to hell. 
But I think they miss out on God's plan for their life. They miss out on proving to the Lord that I'm willing to suffer anything to show that I love you. I couldn't do that without God helping, but I'll tell you what helped me. Every day I would meditate to the best of my knowledge on the love of Christ. From the beginning, it's one of the things, I was in a brethren assembly and they never taught me that. They study the scriptures in depth and study the meaning of verses and so many things. But somehow the Lord led me past that and said, the most important thing in the Christian life is to know the love of Christ. And that passes knowledge. What does it mean when the love of Christ passes knowledge? It means you can only know it in your heart. It's not an intellectual thing. You can hear a message about the love of Christ and understand everything and understand it so well that you can even preach it to others. But if you don't experience it in your heart, you won't stand up for him when you're tested. Like Peter, I think he loved Christ, but I don't think he knew how much it meant. So when some woman in the outside the high priest's office when Jesus was taken for trial, asked him, hey, you belong to Christ? He said, no, 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 I don't belong to him. And somebody, some other person said, I, I know you are a, you've got the same accent. You belong to him. He said, no, 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 I don't. Three times he denied the Lord. He had been with the Lord for three and a half years. He'd seen the miracles. He'd pulled up a whole net full of fish and he'd seen the amazing miracles Jesus did. He knew this is the son of God. He knew that God is almighty. Everything was there. Almighty God can protect me from anything. This person has loved me so much and he is the son of God without a doubt. I've seen amazing miracles nobody's ever seen in their life. It was all there. But it was not in his heart. He knew the love of Christ intellectually. If you had asked Peter, do you know about the love of Christ? He'd have given a lecture on it. But in the time of testing, he said, no, I don't know him. And when I don't stand up for the standards of Jesus Christ in a church or in my place of work or with my unconverted relatives, when I go to visit them, I don't know the love of Christ in my heart. I know it in my head. And that's quite possible with some of you. I remember once a relative of mine, we're all Syrian Orthodox Jacobite families. Their, grand, uh, their child was getting immersed, not immersed, sorry, sprinkled. They call it baptism. It's not baptism, but then you know how it is in the Orthodox churches. They sprinkle a baby. And they asked me to come for that ceremony or at least come for the lunch after that to celebrate it. My close relatives, my mother's sister and their child and their daughter's child. So I said, I'm sorry. I don't agree with this form of sprinkling called baptism. So I'm sorry I can't come. And I can't even come for the lunch to celebrate it because I can't celebrate a disobedience to God's word. I mean, they must have thought I was crazy. Okay, you can't come for the sprinkling ceremony. Can't you at least come for the lunch? I said, no. I will not come to celebrate a disobedience to God's word. Now, I'm not asking anybody else to do that. But I said, Lord, I will not compromise in any little thing. My light must shine brightly everywhere, and especially with my unconverted relatives. Let them think I'm crazy. Let them reject me. Let them make fun of me. I don't care. I praise the Lord. It deepened my relationship with Jesus. And I read the word. I got revelation on it. And God anointed me to preach the gospel. And I was 23 years old. And I was preaching to 5,000 people in conferences when I was 23 years old. Brother Buck Singh, who was an outstanding servant of God, invited me to speak with him at his conference in 1963. I was 23 years old with 5,000 people. And there was such a blessing there that he wanted me to speak again. And what was I was just, I was baptized just two and a half years earlier. 
Then I knew I was not a public speaker. In school, I was not a public speaker. I had no gift for that. But I think God had mercy on me. That's all I can say. But I know one thing. If I had not stood for the Lord, he would not have anointed me. And subsequently, you know, after I came out for full-time Christian service, my love for the Lord was tested by my attitude toward the compromise I saw in Christendom. So many churches. This asking for money, getting a salary, sending out news reports. I said, Lord, I don't see this anywhere. I don't see Jesus or Paul ever asking for a salary for serving the Lord. And yet every single pastor and priest gets a salary. It's not in the Bible. So now my conflict was not with secular people, but with Christians. I said, Lord, I love you. And I will stand for what I see in your scripture about I won't take it. And that's been my policy for all these 58 years that I've been in full-time Christian work. I've never received a salary from anybody. I've never sent out a prayer letter about the work I do to anyone. None of you know what all the Lord has done through CFC churches in different places. None of you know about the miracles the Lord has done. None of you know about how many churches there are and what, in how many countries there are. You don't get a report. We've never sent out reports. We never send out, because reports are usually asking for money. We are doing this work. We say, listen, everybody knows this is a request for money. We don't want any money. God provides enough. enough. The apostles did so much, or Paul traveled so much. But he used his own money. He got an inheritance from his father towards the end of his life, and he could live you read in Acts chapter 28, towards the end of that chapter, that Paul lived in his own rented house for two years in Rome. That's like going and living in London or New York for two years in your own rented house. I don't think you guys who earn so much in the Gulf can go and live there for two years in your own rented house. How did this apostle Paul go and live there? He had honored God all his life trying to live simply and uh, spend as little money stitching tents to earn some living. And towards the end of his life, I don't have time to go into all those details in scripture. It seems pretty clear. The inheritance which was denied him by his rich father in Tarsus when he became a Christian was finally given to him when he was in prison. And he became so rich that even the governor Felix wanted to get a bribe from him. How much bribe do you get from a full-time worker? He must have been wanting hundreds of thousands of dollars in the equivalent of that. And he knew that Paul had got it as an inheritance. That's how he was able to live in uh, Rome, the capital city of the world, for two years in his own rented house. It's an amazing statement. I mentioned that to say, I felt the devil was after Paul because Paul was disturbing his kingdom so much. Then he said, okay, this guy is stitching tents and earning his living and not asking for money. Let me see what happens when he becomes old and he crosses 60 and he'll be weak. Then what will he do? And that's the time he got the inheritance from his father. God never lets down his servant. It happened to me. I got an inheritance from my father too, which helped me so that I wouldn't depend on anybody because God saw that from the beginning, I would not depend on anyone for my needs. Yeah, I got a wife who supported me in that and we were, lived extremely simply in, in the early years in great poverty. And the Lord tested us. What am I saying that? We did it because we loved Jesus. My wife loved Jesus and I loved Jesus. And it was a love that passed knowledge. It was a love that touched our heart, that changed our way of life. Most of you have come from Christian homes. And therefore, you may not have sacrificed much to follow Jesus. You probably earned the respect of other people because you're a Christian. There are people who come to the Gulf with false certificates to get a visa. I hope none of you have done that. Zacchaeus, when he did something wrong and he met with Jesus, 
I don't know whether you read this amazing verse in Luke chapter 19. In a moment, he knew of the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Luke 19, we read that Jesus came to Jericho. And he came and he passed by that sycamore tree where Jesus, he knew that and he was prompted by the Holy Spirit. He was passing through. And it's amazing, Jesus was so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When Zacchaeus, verse 4, had climbed a sycamore tree to see him. And when Jesus, see this verse, Luke 19, verse 5, you've got to read between the lines like they say. When Jesus came to the place under the tree, as he was walking down the road, the Holy Spirit prompted him, look up. There's a man called Zacchaeus there. And so he looked up, verse 5, and said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I have to stay at your house today. He'd never met him before. Not just say hi to him, but stay at your house. And he hurried and came down. And then as he was walking towards his house, when he came outside the house, you read in verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped. Have you noticed? Did you notice that statement? Zacchaeus stopped. When you read the Bible carefully, you come to a situation like that and say, why was that? That's what I do. I don't rush through such verses. I say, Lord, why did he stop? And, say, and let me paraphrase what he said. Why did he want to give half his possessions to the poor, verse 8, and four times back to those whom he had cheated as a tax collector? Jesus was going to stay in his house that day. He had said that. And at the gate of the house, Zacchaeus stopped and said, Lord, let me add what he said there, which is not mentioned here. Lord, this house has been built with unrighteous money. I've cheated the government in giving them the taxes I earned that I got from people. I've got a lot of unrighteous money. And with that unrighteous money, I've built this house. I, you can't come into this house. This is an impure house. It looks like a grand building. But I've cheated the government on paying taxes. I didn't pay the tax due when I got money. So Lord, I want to make a promise to you before you enter my house and stay tonight with me. All those whom I cheated as a tax collector, I'm going to give them back with interest and more than interest. Verse 8, four times what I took from them. He was proving that he had been freed from the love of money. And there are so many people I cheated, I don't know what their address is. All these people who has their address, I know I can go to their house and give them four times. What about those people I don't know? I will not conveniently forget about all that. Sometimes people, Christians conveniently forget about, uh, I can't give that money because I don't know where he is. Uh -huh. But Zacchaeus was upright. He said, I can't keep it in my bank account because it's unrighteous money. What are you going to do, Zacchaeus? You don't know the address. I will take it and give it to the poor so that it, my bank account is emptied of that unrighteous money. Where do you find such radical people? And this chap had not seen Calvary yet. This chap had not known the things we know. And he had met the Lord for the first time. Boy, he challenges me. No wonder Jesus said, the only time Jesus ever said that about anybody, salvation has come to this house. Verse 9, because he's a son of Abraham. What did Abraham do when the king of Sodom said, take all the goods that you have won in the battle? He said, I have sworn to my God that I will not even take a shoelace from you. That's what Abraham said. I will not take a shoelace from you. Take it. I have a right to it, but I won't take it. You know, those who won in battle had a right to take all the things that they won, and he won't take it. 
because Melchizedek had just come before him and told him, your God is the possessor of heaven and earth. Why do you want the little money that you get from the king of Sodom? And then he said, Jesus said in verse 10, Luke 19, 10, the son of man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Lost in what? Not lost going to hell. Lost in the love of money. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost in the love of money. Do you know that those who love money are lost? We think only of those who are lost and going to hell. A man who loves money is lost. It's a pit. You know what I said when I read that years ago? I was getting a very good salary in the na as a naval officer. I said, Lord Jesus, I want to be honest. I love money. I'm lost in the love of money. Please save me because I can't save myself. But it says here, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost in the love of money. Like Zacchaeus. And he said to him, salvation has come to this house. This guy's been saved from the love of money. He wasn't talking about hell there. He hadn't yet died on the cross. I said, Lord, save me as well. Do you think you don't love money? I'll tell you something. There's not a human being on earth who doesn't love money. That homeless man and the beggars on the streets of India, they love money. And the multimillionaires, billionaires also love money. And everybody in between loves money. To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge requires that i got to check myself and say, am I just listening to a message? Just a nice theme to talk about or is it something I want to change my life? You know that I speak straight to people. I don't beat around the bush and tickle people and make them happy. I often feel I'm like a surgeon. And the surgeon has to tell the patient, listen, you got a cancer. The love of money is a cancer. And here a doctor tells a patient, you got cancer. But I love you enough. I'll treat you freely. I'll do an operation on you and you wouldn't. There'll be no charge. That's how we preach. There'll be no charge, but it'll be a bit painful. I have to cut you open. In that case, in the body, and when I speak, it is the heart that gets cut open. But I'll tell you something. If you submit to what, I, to what I'm saying and what I do, you'll be freed from the cancer. Do you want it or not? And that patient says, no, doctor, it's, I don't like pain and all. Just give me some painkiller or something. I'll swallow a tablet and you'll die. But the sensible person says, go ahead, doctor, cut me open. I hate cancer. And the true disciple of Jesus says, Lord, I hate the love of money. Get, get it out of my system. You won't let me starve. My wife and I have never starved in all these 58 years. We ate three meals a day every day, and we never asked anybody for money. We never took a salary from any of our churches. God has provided for us. I just want to... I believe God wanted us to be a living testimony to others that you honor God, he'll honor you. That's all. That so was my great desire from my younger days. Lord, you said those who honor me, I will honor. And I don't want to just quote a verse. I want to prove in my life to others that if you honor God, he will honor you. Not only that, I remember when my father was dying. My father was a fine believer before I was born again. Before I was born, he was born again. And way back in 1982, he was in our house. He was in a deathbed. And my oldest son was 12 years old. And my youngest son was about two or three years old. And he called me. And he said, son, you got four boys. You've got to educate them. You can't just let them go through school and finishing. They've got to go through college. And here you were, a well-known preacher, traveling here and there, and you could have earned money like that. And you've given up all that. And you sit here the last six years. You've been sitting at home 
calling it a house church. And, you know, we had started CFC six years earlier. He saw that and he couldn't understand it because I was being invited all over the place before that. He said, you're like Billy Graham. You can have a great ministry and you can take care of your children and educate them. I said, Dad, I'm not called to be like Billy Graham. I'm called to build local churches, small groups of people who work, function as a body and who love one another. I'm not interested in becoming a famous preacher. But anyway, he said, you got to do something. So you sit with these 15, 20 people in your house and call it a church. How are you going to take care of your children? All these poor people come to your church and you've never, never even taken an offering here. So I told him, Dad, if my children go to a school here, the fees are not very high, but I won't even be able to pay that if I did not seek God's kingdom first. This is what I told my dad on his deathbed. Jesus said, if you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, all that you need and your family needs will be added to you. I said, Dad, I believe that. Everything I need will be added to me. When it comes time for that college education, I don't know where it is, how it will be, but if I seek God's kingdom first, it will be done. And if I don't seek God's kingdom first, even the small school fees I will not be able to pay. Of course, my dad was not in full-time Christian work. He had been an engineer all his life. So he probably couldn't understand that. But he passed away soon after that in 1982. And from heaven, today if he sees, that is what, nearly 40 years later, if he were to look down from heaven, if he could see, he would say to me, son, you were right. God provided scholarships, full scholarships, for, or a major part of scholarships to all my children. I didn't plan that or scheme it. I didn't even know about it. He took care of them. He provided them good jobs. And I taught them, honor God, and above all that, they're all serving the Lord. That's what I rejoice in the most. Why am I saying all this? It arose out of my understanding of the love of Christ, which passes knowledge in the heart. To know the love of Christ, let's look at that verse again, which you've got as our theme, Ephesians and chapter 3. Read it carefully. That you may be able to understand with all the saints, the breadth and length, and verse 18, the height and depth. You know, usually we think of three dimensions. But here is four dimensions. This is supernatural thing. Breadth, length, height, and depth. That's how you know the love of Christ, which goes beyond knowledge. That's the point. You cannot understand it in your mind. You've got to understand it in your heart. You've got to experience it. Then you will be filled up to all the fullness of God. And you've got to understand, it says in verse 18, with all the saints. If you've got a grudge in your heart against some brother or sister, you will not know the love of Christ. Read that verse again. To comprehend that is in your heart, along with all the saints, the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, this four-dimensional not three-dimensional, four-dimensional love of Christ, which is beyond knowledge. Three dimensions we can understand. Four dimensions I don't understand. It goes beyond knowledge of the mind. It's in the heart. and you, But you can know it only if your heart is open to all of your fellow believers. I want to ask you, my brothers, do you have a grudge in your heart towards anyone? I don't care who it is. You will not know the love of Christ to some extent then. Because that grudge blocks off a part of your heart from knowing God's love. I decided some years ago that I'll never keep a grudge in my heart. Many people have harmed me. Many people have called me the devil and done all types of things. But I said, Lord, by your grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I love them. To me, the mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to have a heart of love for all people. Not speaking in tongues. 
I do speak in tongues. I have spoken in tongues for 48 years. That's only between me and God. But to me, the greatest proof of the fullness of the Spirit is not speaking in tongues. That's just one gift God gives to some people. Many people don't have it. It doesn't matter. But the love of Christ that all of us can have, the Holy Spirit comes primarily to give us that. See, turn with me now to Romans and chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Please, you've got to know these verses. It says here in Romans 5 and verse 5. Easy to remember. Romans 5, 5. Never forget it. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. To me, this is the mark of being filled with the Spirit. Not Acts 2, 4, which the Pentecostal quote, that they spoke in tongues. That's one of the gifts. God gives it to some, he doesn't give it to everybody. But this is for everyone. The Holy Spirit comes and pours out the love of God in our hearts, and then it flows out like rivers of living water towards other people. That means I don't have a grudge against a single human being in the world. You know, religious people have taken me to court in India because I exposed their wrong doctrines. And they wanted to imprison me, saying I've defamed them and all that type of stuff. For They wanted to imprison me for 16 years. And they did all types of corrupt things. And when the high court threw out their charge, they went to the Supreme Court. They took me to the Supreme Court. Ten years they took me to court. I love them. I love them with all my heart. And I say, Lord, don't punish them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who they're trying to hurt. I want to see them in heaven. Because the Lord has forgiven me so much, I can forgive anybody in the world, anything. That's how you know the love of Christ has come to your heart. If you've got a grudge against a single human being, did some relative of yours cheat you of your inheritance? Love him. Did some mother-in-law mother come into your home and trouble you? Love her. Otherwise, don't talk about knowing the love of Christ that passes knowledge. It'll just be a theme for a conference and you'll forget it completely and it won't change your life one bit. If you have been attending this conference even for one day, just today, and it has not made any difference to you till now. It won't make any difference tomorrow also. And you'll be the same next year as you've been in the past years. It must not be like that, my dear brothers and sisters. Let this conference be a radical turning point in your life. That knowing the love of Christ is not going to be a head knowledge to you anymore. Or something that turns your life around. Okay, I'll tell you one more thing before I close, and that is I've said this many times before, but all of you may not have heard it. Lest I forget Gethsemane. You remember you sang it just now? Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Just like you sang. Think of that. What happened in Gethsemane? You know that. I don't have to turn to that verse. You know that when Jesus went to Gethsemane, it says three times he went and his, he prayed to the Father and his uh, blood was like great drops of blood. And what was he praying? Matthew 26 and verse 38. Matthew 26, verse 38 and 39. He told Peter, James and Don, they were grieved and distressed. He couldn't go alone. He went to get somebody with these three disciples. He said, please pray with me. He asked three imperfect human beings to pray with him. And he said to them, verse 38, Matthew 26, 38, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And he went a little further in 39. He prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. You know, I've thought of the, the only request that Jesus made to the Father that was not granted. The perfect Son of God who lived a life pleasing the Father in every single thing 
we get disturbed when one prayer of ours is not answered. Here is a prayer. Father, let this cup pass from me. Who's praying this prayer? One, one who lived a perfect life. God did not answer that. Did not grant that request. You get disturbed when God doesn't grant you some request. Here's a request. Jesus prayed, let this cup pass from me. And Father said no. His prayer on the cross didn't, didn't even get an answer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No answer. You get disturbed when you don't get an answer to prayer. Jesus prayed the most important prayer there and he never got an answer. My brother, sister, humble yourself. We are not more important than Jesus Christ. His one request was not granted. His one prayer was not answered on the cross. Didn't even get an answer. He was allowed to hang there naked with just an underwear, laughed at by everybody. This is the savior we follow. If you love him, you'll be willing to pay any price to live for his honor. These are the things that help me. We love him, 1 John 4, it says we love him because he first loved us. So as a young Christian, when I was 20 years old, I say, Lord, please help me to know your love, then I will love you more. And even all these 64 years, I've said, Lord, open my heart to see your love more. And I'll give you one example of how the Lord showed it to me. Here this prayer, Matthew 26, 39. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. And I said, Lord, what is the thing that happened there? What is that cup? Did you ever ask the Lord, what is that cup? What is the cup that Jesus, he was willing to obey the Father in everything. And yet he said, don't let, the, I don't want to drink this cup. You know what the cup was? It was not the physical suffering. He was willing to be beaten and hammered and crucified a hundred times or a thousand times. That he was not afraid of. But there's one thing he didn't want. That fellowship he had with the Father for eternity. To be broken. Didn't want it. That's the cup. And I imagine in my mind a conversation going on there. Father, please don't let this cup pass from me and some angel comes to him and says, but it's only going to be for three hours. Only three hours. Your fellowship with the Father will be broken. And then you'll come back again. It'll be over. Because at the end of three hours, he said, Father, into your hands I come in my spirit. It was only for three hours that he was forsaken. But he says, I don't want to be forsaken even for one second. I've been in fellowship with my Father from all eternity. I don't want that to be broken even for one second. Then I imagine a conversation. The father says, okay, to Jesus, you can come straight up to heaven from Gethsemane because you've lived a perfect life. You will not be forsaken. But Zach will go to hell. And Jesus says, Zach will go to hell. Okay. Then I'll drink the cup. That's the word the Lord spoke to me more than 45 years ago. I wept, and I wept, and I wept. I said, Lord, now I know how much you love me. The love of Christ that passes knowledge. I said, Lord, my whole life is yours. I have no ambition. I don't want honor. I don't want money. I don't want anything. I just want my life to be poured out for you. So that one day when I see you face to face in heaven, I will have no regret that I live for myself. I'll be able to bow down and kiss your feet and say, I tried to show my gratitude for your dying for me. I, want to, I don't want to have any regret when I go to heaven that I live for myself or live for money or live for any of the stupid things that people live on this earth for. Dear brothers and sisters, I love you all very much. That's why I've spoken the truth from my own experience. Ask God to reveal to you. It's an inner thing. It's not a head thing. What you heard from me is in your mind. Ask God to reveal to you the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It will change your life. You will live the most useful life that you can ever live on this earth. Teach your children. 
to live such a life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, Lord, I can never speak the way I should. I try my best. But wherever there's been limitation on me, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take the word to people's hearts. And I want every one of these dear brothers and sisters, not that they just live a comfortable life on earth and just go to some church and sing the songs and listen to the messages, but that their life will count for you in their place of work with their unconverted relatives so that when they come to the end of their life, they'll be able to say, I've finished the course my Lord laid out for me. Bless each one here, Lord. That they'll never compromise, they'll honor you, and they'll experience your honoring them. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.